You are listening to the Anxiety Podcast, where we support you to overcome anxiety and reduce stress. We will get vulnerable and it will be real. Here's your host, Tim J.P. Collins. Hello and welcome to the Anxiety Podcast. I haven't done an interview for a while, but today I have a guest on the show and uh, yeah, she's got some great insights, somebody who's gone through anxiety themselves and has done a variety of things to improve their lives and has got some some great stories to share along the way. So I look forward to introducing Megan in a moment. Before I do that, head on over to anxietypodcast.com for all your uh, end anxiety toolkits and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I've had a lot of stuff going on in my life lately, so it's nice to to be here and, and sharing this with you. Uh, if you follow me on social media, on Instagram, you can find my personal account um, under Tim J.P. Collins. And on Facebook, I'm Tim J.P. Collins. You can see my recent announcements of leaving my job and starting my new thing. And maybe I'll talk about that next week. Um, because there's probably lots to say about diving into something new at this moment in time. But um, suffice to say, super excited. If you want to find out more, go check out the socials and you will see all the bits and bobs there. I did want to also say thank you to my patrons. Um, If you support me through Patreon, uh, it makes a, a huge difference to me and I very much appreciate it. It's really how the the show keeps on running. That's the, the the biggest source of it for sure. And so if you want to check out more, you can go to anxietypodcast.com and click on membership or go to patreon.com forward slash anxiety podcast. And yeah, you can throw down a uh, dollar or $5 or $10 a month, or whatever it is. And that goes to towards help running the show and paying the bills and, and all the sorts of things that go ahead or go along with creating this very high quality broadcast. Um, I'm now actually set up in my new home office. I'm recording this not in the car for the first time ever because I got a new door installed between the office, which used to be the living room, now my office, uh, treat yourself and the kitchen. And um, so I got some, I got a contract to come, to come and install a door because I'm crap at installing stuff. And uh, since then, I've put some sort of weather stripping around the sides and I put this thing underneath and actually does a pretty good job of making this room not be able to hear everybody in that in the house. So there you go. Podcasting in an office is like feels so novel and not like resting. You know, normally I'm balancing. I'm not even joking. I'm balancing my microphone on its little tripod on top of my laptop, sat on my lap and uh, in the car. So I don't have to sweat out there today. It's nice. Brilliant. Um, This podcast is also brought to you by our regular sponsor, BetterHelp. So thank you so much to them for supporting the show. BetterHelp, if you haven't heard about it before, is, um, yeah, online counseling, essentially. So if there's, there's things that are bothering you, BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own professional uh, licensed therapist and you can connect remotely so they've been doing this for a while but now during recent times even more relevant to be able to connect remotely and, and not have to go face to face for some counseling stuff you'll get timely and thoughtful responses plus you can schedule the sessions to be via phone or video so it's up to you if you don't want to be on video you don't have to be on video there's a time in my life where I didn't want to be on video now you can't get me off it. Um, but yeah, you don't have to sit in, in in an uncomfortable waiting room. It's just ready to go. Um, and they cover all sorts of stuff. So they talk about um, depression, stress, anxiety, relationships, sleeping, trauma, anger, all the stuff. Everything you share is confidential. Um, so yeah, you can check out testimonials on their site if you want to hear about the other experience that other people have had and you can go to betterhelp.com slash anxiety podcast you'll get 10 percent off your first month um they've helped um, worked with eight hundred thousand people taking charge of their mental health and no doubt that number has risen in recent times because it's stressed us all out but hopefully the world is uh is, is doing all right again now so anyway better help that's h-e-l-p dot com slash anxiety podcast. All right. So today I am interviewing Megan Gallagher. Um, she's got a great story, you know, somebody who experienced anxiety as a child and then through her teens and somewhere, I think around 14, she, she said, look, I need to make a change. I need to do something about this. And now she's out there, um, presenting and talking on the topic of mental health with young people because, Clearly, I'm too old. She can relate to him a bit better. (laughs) 
but she goes to schools and does talks and and shares her story to to give other people i think the courage to take on life and and um yeah do the best they possibly can so without further ado let's bring megan on and get into the conversation here we go okay so megan gallagher welcome to the anxiety podcast thank you so much for having me tim i'm so honored to be here yeah, this is fun. I haven't actually done an interview for a while. So back in the original days of the Anxiety Podcast, I did, I think I did one interview a week and I did one solo session every week. And then over time, just really more due to time constraints on my side, it's much easier just to create episodes on my own when things pop into my head. Um, but when people come along who I think have got really good, interesting stories to say, um, uh, and you're definitely one of those, then I think it's worth kind of taking the time out to do it. And now on the basis that um, I just quit my job and um, it's coronavirus time. Um, yeah, I got a yes. bit of time, so it's good. Um, so yeah, maybe just a good place to start would be um, to tell us a bit about your, your story. I know you've got quite a, a really interesting story, particularly for people listening to this. So maybe you can yeah. walk us through it and I'll just interject with questions uh, as we go. Yeah. So I have struggled not not as much currently, but basically on and off my whole life from, you know, three years old toddler to 17 years old, I was struggling with chronic anticipatory anxiety and panic attacks, as well as when I was a teenager, it was a lot of body image issues and it was a lot of comparing myself to other girls. I never felt good enough in my body. And, you know, even though on the outside looking in, I was the class clown, I was always really goofy. You know, I, no one would, you wouldn't really expect, um, it it didn't really match my personality. I've always been very extrovert, very friendly, social bubbly. And so when I was a freshman in high school at 14 is when I feel like I was old enough and also you're going through puberty when you're a teenager. So, you know, I was old enough, but I also was just going through these body changes where I wasn't a five-year-old, you know, crying anymore. I was a 14 year old and I felt like, you know, "Mm, okay, I'm paying attention more, you know, to my body and what's going on and what makes this happen and these movements and why does my body react this way? And I noticed, okay, you know, it's, 10 a.m. It's English class. And then I I start feeling this way. I start feeling the fast heart rate. My muscles get very like clenched and I feel like I can't breathe. And I feel very just like I can't focus. I feel very out of my body. I feel like I'm kind of floating all over the place. And like, I just can't focus. Like I have to bite my nails or pick or do something. And I just started noticing it's interesting how it happens at the same day, you know, I mean the same time, same class, like clockwork day after day. And then it just got to a point where I was almost done with my freshman year and I realized I couldn't function. I felt like, you know, my grades are being affected. My social life, my eating habits were really abnormal I just knew that I needed help because I really didn't know what was going on. Um, in my school, there were there was no education about mental health or it was very just the basic, you know, hasn't changed since the 70s where it's like sex ed and don't do drugs and this is how you get into this Ivy League college so you're set up for life. But I was like, why aren't they talking about just like how we're feeling? Why Why does no one talk about our thoughts and all that stuff. So that experience personally, just my own journey, but then also noticing the lack of communication in my school and amongst my peers, it me to be the person now as an adult that goes to middle schools and high schools and sparks that open conversation of, it's okay if you're feeling anxious, it's okay if you're feeling depressed, it's if you're feeling not good enough. And these are the things that you can do. And here are the actual steps that I personally took to feel better. And I went to therapy. I started having a morning and nighttime routine. Even before school, I would wake up, journal, work out. I wouldn't look at phone. I, you know, didn't drink coffee. It's just little things that I did over time really, really helped me. But I will say this with anxiety, one, you have to want to get better. Because that's like anything you can water, but you can't force it to drink. So 
if you are struggling with anxiety or depression, you like, you have to want, you have to have the like internal decision of, I am feeling this way here, but I want to be up here. So how do I take that leap from here to here? You have to want to get help and want to get better because it's like getting into shape. No one's going to do it for you. You like, you have to pick yourself up, put on your workout clothes, drag yourself to the gym. That's like with anxiety, your mind is a muscle and you have to work at it every day. So it's, it takes work and it takes the, you know, the choice of, Right now, I can choose to watch Netflix for two hours, or I can choose to, you know, journal my thoughts. I can choose to listen to a guided meditation. Yeah, I think that's, I mean, I think that's huge as well. I had um, one of my multiple interview uh, interviewees in the past would always say that. Um, I kind of asked him the question, what does make, what does make, uh, kind of cause people to change their behavior? And he said, when the pain gets bad enough, that's when people change when the pain gets bad enough. And also the analogy of like, you know, the, the two old men sat on the front stoop of their house and the dog walks over and it lays down on a nail and the guy's like, Hey, the dog's laying on a nail. You're not going to move it. And he's like, no, 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 he'll move on his own. When it hurts <laughs> enough, when it feels it. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So that, I think that's such a insightful thing you said about people have to want to do it because you would assume that everybody who's feeling discomfort wants to feel better. Not, not everyone wants to feel better. And that's one thing that yeah. I think a lot of people are shocked about. Right. Cause some people, well, there's that in itself is a whole sort of minefield of discussion to go into. Some people, um, it becomes their identity or they, they resonate with it because it supports the ecosystem. There so within. true. Um, but yeah, for sure. And I think for me, in my personal experience, it was kind of like, to start with, I didn't want to admit I had anxiety. So I just sort of said, well, maybe it's just stress or I should just have another beer and hopefully bury it a little bit. Right, yeah. Um, and do those sorts of things. But it took a lot because of the shame associated with it. And I think mental health has come a long way in the last 10 years. But um, I think because of the shame associated with it, I would, I would think like this is the weakest possible thing to admit to ever. Yes. To say I have anxiety and I can't control it in, at this moment in time, right? Yeah. So yeah, I think that is key. But once you get, once you can flick, flick the switch, and that's kind of what I talk a lot about on this podcast, and how you can take, start taking the incremental steps to feel better, whether that's you know nutrition or diet or exercise, or whatever that happens to be, um, then everything becomes possible. Everything becomes a possibility. And, and yes. I was thinking just this morning about you know that concept of you can either watch Netflix, which is very interesting and very alluring and designed to get your attention that's why they have now they have the top 10 shows and they send mm-hmm. emails when new things are coming out like it's <laughs> damn good um but at the same time that you know three or four hours of watching episodes could be three or four hours of learning or half that amount of time or any of that amount of time right yeah so yeah it's also it's, it's it's always a choice and um i i really think it's fascinating what you mentioned earlier about so, like some people, they don't want to get better. And some people, sadly, like they kind of love the woe is me. I think a lot of people genuinely do like having people feel bad for them and having people like pity them. And that's, I mean, that's a whole other topic, but I, mm. I just feel like for me, my thoughts are going to make me feel one of two ways. They're, the, they're either going to make me feel empowered and motivated and really excited or they're going to make me feel really crappy like I can't do it or that you know just I think with anxiety it doesn't matter what I think but I I know when I'm having anxiety because every thought that I'm thinking it makes me feel trapped or stuck kind of like I'm in quicksand and that I can't get out I feel like anxiety is just, I know how I'm feeling. It's like, I'll never, like, I'll, I can never get better. I can never get myself out of this situation, but it's just not true. Mm. Um, I think that's kind of what a lot of people have felt. I think a lot of people have felt anxiety for the first time during the coronavirus thing. Yes. (laughs) Because that was a, that was a great example of something which 
didn't have a defined end. It didn't have a defined timeline. Nobody can mm-hmm. tell you we're definitely going to, I mean, we still don't officially have like a, um, a vaccine for it. So nobody can tell you like it's going to be cured. It's, it's, uh, it's uncertainty, which us anxious or historically anxious people, we're very familiar with that. Um, but for everybody else in the, in the population, they're like, Oh my God, this is, you know, very unsettling. And I'm like, yeah, welcome to anxiety. That's what it feels like all the yeah. time. <laughs> right. Yes. Um, when I was listening to your Ted talk, you talked a little bit about, you know, you were going through some of that journaling and exercise and, and doing all those activities. And then you went, um, you were describing going on a trip to New Orleans. Can mm-hmm. you talk a bit about why you went there and, and what that experience was like? Yes. Okay. So first of all, New Orleans, this is not to like promote anything, but New Orleans is literally my favorite city ever. It's the fun. I love the South. It's so fun. The community, like the, I mean, just, so for me, it was, I was 16, a sophomore in high school and it was my summer going into summer going into junior year. It was summer break. And I felt like I had been in therapy for about seven months and I really had learned enough tips and tools on, and I did a lot of hypnotherapy too, which really helped me get to the root of why I'm feeling this way. And, you know, my childhood and just my childhood was amazing, but you know, a trauma is a trauma and it doesn't mean, you know, it has to be something like horrific, but everyone has you know, why they think the way that they do, why they act the way that they do. And for me, my anxiety, it's hereditary. My dad has it. So it runs in his side of the family. So just the therapy really allowed me to just kind of like look at myself from an outside perspective and to not judge myself anymore of, come on, Megan, like you have it, your life is so good. You you have it so good. You grew up in this town, your house is, you know, what is there to be anxious about? But it's like, no, that's not fair to do to myself because my mind is wired, but it's also gotten me to where I am today. So it has its benefits because I feel like I have so much energy and I'm constantly overthinking everything. So it really has served a purpose where it, it allows me to like, if I fixate on something, I don't stop until I get it. So that's like, you know, my TED talk, for example, it took me two years to get it. And I didn't like two years and I just did not stop. But back to what you were saying. So Mm -hmm. New Orleans, best city ever. When I was 16, summer going into my junior year of high school, I thought, you know, I feel like I want to do something different. I'm ready for like a change. I just want something awesome. And so my parents, they were, you know, Googling teen adventure summer camp programs and they came across Rustic Pathways, which once again, it's an amazing kind of um, travel program for teenagers and they can do community service focused trips or they can also do photography, just different things. And they literally, they go to every single country and continent. It's incredible. So at first I was like, you know what? I'm ready to push myself outside my comfort zone. I'm going to go like a little bit, but I don't want to go too far. So I thought I'll stay in the United States. I'll go to New Orleans. But, um, and then I remember like we signed up and I was like, heck yeah, I just did it. And then the reality kind of set in of like, (gasps) wait, I still like, I, oh my gosh, how did I do this to myself? Like, I'm going to have, I'm the one who has to get on the plane like by myself. I just screwed myself over, but it literally, it was, it was the greatest trip ever. And I remember just the weeks leading up to it when we got my, um, list of like the packing items I should bring just started becoming more real. And I was like, Oh wow. Like, Oh no, I can't do this. And then, um, the day I left 6 a.m., my mom woke me up. And I talk about this in my TED Talk where I just looked at her and started crying because I was like, mom, help me. I can't do this. And so, but I, you know, I did it anyway. And that was just a really powerful moment where I knew that my mom loved me. I knew she loved me, but she said, Megan, this is your anxiety talking. And I can tell when you're like the real Megan, the happy bubbly versus like the, uh, so she's like, I love you, but you're going on this trip. You will thank me later. 
And I just remember her saying that. And I was like, maybe I should trust my mom because I don't think I was like, you know, I don't think my mom would send me on a trip where she knew like I would die or something horrible. Mm. Worst case would happen. But you know, that's what anxiety, it makes you believe. It makes you believe that the worst possible scenario is going to happen. Even though if you say it out loud, you're like, what are the odds that lightning would hit the plane or, you know, what are the real, really? So I went two weeks Um, New Orleans was amazing. I lived in a house with other teenagers. There was 15 of us and we were rebuilding houses that had been destroyed by Hurricane Katrina. And this was 2012 and Hurricane Katrina was 2007. So it was five year difference. yeah. Yeah. But, and that's the thing about anxiety. It's like doing, you know, my hometown where I came from east of San Francisco, the Bay area and Northern California was very nice. And so for me at, you know, 15 to be plopped into the ninth ward of Louisiana, like New Orleans, just where houses were destroyed. And still there, it looked like a ghost town in some parts, even after all this time. And I got to meet people that we were fixing their homes and, you know, just hear, hearing the people like their gratitude I will never, ever, ever forget just how grateful these people were that we were here to help and hearing their stories about how they lost so much, but they were like the happiest people, like just their spirits were so uplifting. And there were just so many, like, I cannot explain to you how many epiphany and aha, like moments I was having that whole trip of, oh my gosh. And you know, I also remember my mom told me when I was before the trip, she said, Megan, I promise you, you're going to be having too much. You're going to be too busy having fun to be worried. Like you won't have time to feel anxious because you're going to be too busy having fun and running around. And I was like, are you sure? Are you sure? And she, um, she was right. And I was so just, I like that trip really, I will, I was never the same after that trip because I was like, not in a bad way. You know, I wasn't thinking, Oh, Megan, what do you have to be on? Like your life is so good. I I wasn't like that, but I was just more like, wow. The, I, it was more introspective of these people in new Orleans. They've lost so much like loved ones have passed away, birth certificates, all these photographs, these, their homes are gone and they still are happy and they still have a smile on their face and they're still treating me like open, warm hug. So, I mean, that says a lot. And I just was like, wow, it's just so many things that trip just really, really changed my life. Yeah. I find it interesting as well. Cause I think some I've witnessed it myself with some people, but sometimes when, um, somebody tells you to do something and you're feeling anxious, that can make you dig in more. Yes. So it's interesting that your mom said, you know, in as many words, she said, like, trust me, but you need you, that you need to do this. And I know it's not you talking, it's the anxiety talking. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I definitely, I, I likely hear more times when that goes badly than when I'm, somebody's like, well, you're my mom. <laughs> I trust you. You're probably right. Because it's so, because anxiety makes us believe that that is the truth. And it's so irrational that people yeah. find it hard to get through that. And, and, you know, we've, we've heard lots of stories about people who can't, you know, get out of the house or can't go on the trip and the big day comes and they just like, it's just so hard to, to get moving in that instance. Right. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> so good for you and good for your mom that you, you managed to get, get out there. I was going to say, luckily, um, for me, my, like I grew up in a house where my mom forced me to do things. <laughs> like I, I still, you know, was social and outgoing and I still could, you know, thankfully my anxiety was never, severe to the point where I couldn't leave my house. Like I, you know, it was never that bad, but my mom, it's just, I think for me growing up, she was, she was very helpful because even when I was in high school and I would run to the nurse's office and be like, mom, I'm, you know, my stomach hurts. I feel like I have a fever and I'm dying. Can you pick me up from school? Can I come home early? She would say, no, I love you. You're staying. And she would hang up. And I was like, but mom, I'm your, you know, I'm your daughter. Don't you love me? And all these things. But Mm -hmm. I didn't realize at that moment, she was teaching me to just push through the thoughts, which has really shaped me now because I still do that. Like it's just ingrained in me to, 
you know, I'm okay. I'm acknowledging I'm feeling this way. I woke up this morning. I had a, I woke up with a pit in my stomach. Okay. That's awesome. But I'm still going to do what I have mm-hmm. to do today because I'm not going to let my negative thoughts win. I'm going to keep on fighting and pushing against them my whole life. And same with the physical feelings. You know, I'm still like, I don't know. I want to live my life. You know, I want to like fall in love and get married and travel and maybe skydive. (laughs) You know, I want to try things. And these thoughts, I'm like, "Eh, I don't care. Cause I, I've been through enough. I've been through enough to the point where, you know, I know I'm not going to die. Like I know all these worst, I just, I know myself well. So I think for me, I can act as my own therapist a lot of the times. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think there's, well, there's a couple of things in there which, which I think are worth pointing out. The first one is if you are listening to this and you are listening on behalf of somebody, because lots of people who listen to the Anxiety Podcast is because their son or daughter has anxiety yes. or their loved one does and they're trying to get their head around it and trying to understand it. Um, I think there's a huge lesson in what you said for, for people in terms of um, don't become a crutch and, and don't be, you know, if somebody says, oh, I don't feel well, I got a stomach ache, you go and pick them up once or twice and you've created and, you know, a pattern, you've created the, yes. uh, the fact that whenever they struggle, that you are their support person. And if you're not there, then yeah. they're going to get worse and it's going to, you know, and then that's kind of like everything. I mean, people in a sort of, a morbid way people say you're born alone and you die alone but to some there's some truth in that in that you're the only one who can control what you do and and um you know parents and and friends and loved ones can guide you but you ultimately have to make that choice so i think it's it, it's really key to to give particularly our children the opportunity to fail on their own or deal with things on their own and not be not be there to save them all the time right Yes. And I really feel that, you know, if anyone listening does have a loved one or a family member, a roommate or a friend, someone you deeply care about who you feel is suffering from anxiety or some sort of just overthinking, they're constantly negative or they're constantly thinking the worst case scenario. um, Just be aware of the role that you play in their life. Because like you said, if they start connecting the dots and their brain starts thinking, oh, so every time I call Megan, you know, I know she's going to pick up and she's going to take me home or something like, then they start creating this like positive reinforcement reward behavior thing in their brain where they're like, oh, so it's good to stay. And then before you know it, that person is just, you know, they're not living life. They're staying home all day long. They're not pushing themselves outside their comfort zone. They're, you know, they're not going on dates. They're not because they they have a story of it's better to just stay home and it's better to just like be alone and all these things. But it's important to really just be aware of like, okay, what role am I playing? Am I, like you said, am I feeding their anxiety? Am I like, am I helping them? Or am I helping their anxiety? Mm. Which, you know, which one am I helping? The real Megan that like, you know, is a human being and needs to like be pushed or am I helping her anxiety? Yeah. And I, and, and yeah, I'm sure there will be exceptions and there will be times when people need help. But I think I've talked about this before on the show, but every communication you have with people outside of anxiety, whether it's in a romantic relationship or a business deal, the way and the cadence in which you respond and engage with people is starts to become what's expected so if somebody texts you and you text back in 30 seconds and you do that a few times and then on the fifth time you don't respond for a couple of days they're gonna think you are you know pissed off or upset or you you don't like them anymore or something's happened whereas if you you know i'm always an advocate of like being a bit more purposeful with a bit more of a gap not days and days and days but like don't jump on it pretend you have a life and you're yes. doing something else and you've come across your phone an hour later and you're like, Oh, there's a message. I should probably reply. Um, not obviously if you're engaged in an ongoing conversation, but I think right. too many people, too many people live within that one meter radius of their phone and they're on the end of it so much that, and that creates stress in itself. Cause then you feel yeah. like you have to be <laughs> monitoring for messages in case I need to respond to somebody like it's, And that causes a whole, a whole anxiety in itself, like the social media, like the dings and the likes, that's a whole other. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. So I think controlling, 
like creating that pace is useful in that respect. And the other thing which kind of came, f- I'm get, I'm getting from you and some from some of the things that you've said, and I just want to highlight again is that I, I'm a big believer in the fact that action kills anxiety. And and mm. of the people I meet who've like taken strides in their life, it's because maybe they're doing literal action, like they're dancing or exercising or walking or moving or doing things. But then action, as in, you know go on the trip to New Orleans anyway, apply for the new job, ask the person out on the date, like do things like you're going to live forever because you are going to live a long time and hiding isn't going to, isn't going to help you. Right. So I think continuing to like go after your dreams and do things you want to do whilst being uncomfortable will ultimately make you grow. Yes. It's just get comfortable with being uncomfortable. You know, it's um, anxiety is a really challenging thing and I just remember when I was like, for me, I personally experienced anxiety on and off my whole life. It's, it's manifested itself in different forms. And, you know, when I was four years old, it was a lot of me crying. Cause I don't know if you're even talking at four, but I was crying a lot, you know, throwing not tantrums, but just freaking out. And I wanted my mom all the time. And then versus, you know, ninth grade, your freshman year of high school, I was just having these episodes, I called them because I couldn't really label them and just felt like moments where like I would black out. I didn't remember them. I'd be sitting in my English class, just sitting there and all of a sudden I just, and I, I, I couldn't make the connection that my thoughts were creating this physical response of, you know, your body can't handle overanalyzing 4,000 things and and trying to compress it into 30 seconds or thinking, wow, my heart's really fast. Is my heart really fast? Oh, it is really fast. And then, you know, your heart gets faster. So it's like, Mm -hmm. I just had to have, um, but that was the helpful thing with therapy that really allowed me in talking to someone where it was unbiased, you know, it wasn't like my mom who, it just, it was nice talking to someone who, didn't have that like connection of, but I'm your sister and I love you. It was just very like real, very, yeah, real, very real, tangible advice. And, um, it just changed my life. Hypnotherapy in particular, it really just has a special place in my heart because I feel that it allowed me to go really deep into just this state where what's stored in my subconscious and why just very, very powerful stuff. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, and would you say that was kind of one of the biggest things that helped you in terms of long-term stuff? Yes, I would also say um, EFT tapping really helped me because just I like for me saying things out loud really helps me kind of compartmentalize them and kind of think it just makes me feel better. You know, if I have a thought that's circling for hours and then I say it out loud, I can think, okay, I'll say it out loud, you know, kind of take its power away, kind of pull the plug, but then also, you know, is this likely to happen? Is this rational or irrational? Is this something that my mind is anticipating? Is it, you know, is, does this thing, has it even happened yet? It's just really, really powerful just to take note, but yes, hypnotherapy genuinely changed my life. It really just going into like a calming trance and it's like, you know, you're being hypnotized. So you go into this trance where, you know, they're like, okay, Megan, (laughs) you're light as a feather. You're walking down a staircase and, you know, count back from count backwards from 10. Um, You open the door and what do you see? And, you know, it's just very like Mm -hmm. your inner child, childhood work. Um, But You know, I I just had a moment. I remember when I was in hypnotherapy and I was 14 and I was thinking, oh my gosh, you know, I opened the door at the end of the staircase and I saw myself at three years old. And I remember looking at her and I started crying because I was always so worried at that age and crying and freaking out. But a part of me felt sad for that little girl because I was like, why are you so sad all the time? Like you should, a three-year-old shouldn't be sad all the time. You should be happy. You should be you know, like excited about, you know, just, I don't know, a normal three-year-old, like, why are you so upset all the time? But it, it just, yeah. Hypnotherapy, EFT tapping, um, EMDR, very helpful. Also 
just taking time. I think it's important now as I'm an, as I'm an adult of just whenever I need those moments, whether, you know, it's after a business call, I, you know, just worked out whatever I'm feeling just to do what feels good to me, whether that is rolling out a yoga mat and just lying down, putting a hand on my heart, a hand on my stomach and just breathing. Or if that's like Googling guided meditation on YouTube and just listening for 30 minutes, or I'm really into breath work right now. I, I love, you know, lighting a candle, doing some sage, some Palo Santo, just really whatever makes me feel good. I am all about just kind of intuitively, what does my body want to do today? And whether, you know, that also can be, you know, getting in my car, blasting some good music and just driving around for a few hours just to let it go. And, blow off some steam, but I'm just all about kind of letting my body lead the way and just listening to my body rather than my mind. I saw you doing carpool karaoke on Instagram. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. I'm trying to make that a series. I love the show carpool, like the late night show. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, of course. James Corden, he's like my, that's who I want to be. Like, he's just so, the fact that he can sing all the songs sometimes as good as the people whose songs they are. I know. Have you seen the crosswalk karaoke, like the, the crosswalk one? (laughs) No, I haven't seen the crosswalk one. (gasps) Oh, you need to watch that. He get like, they have this, they do all these musical themes. So one is beauty and the beast. And literally James dresses up as Belle, the princess, the Disney princess, and they're walking in the crosswalk. It's the fu- like the funniest thing ever. <laughs> All right, I'll watch it after this. <laughs> um, I was thinking the other day, somebody, was, somebody would, was messaging me and said like, how can my brain think up such crazy things? And after I finished that conversation, I said, well, in my, in my mind, I'm thinking about this and I'm like, well, think about it this way. Like our brains are like super powerful and clever, but we also sit in front of the TV watching a horror film. I don't like horror films, but watching like <laughs> Nef- watching Netflix and we, we're, we're in it. We're emotionally connected to the characters, mm-hmm. even though intellectually we know that that's, there's a camera over there and that person's, you know, somebody else who we've seen interviewed it's, to their celebrity but we're yes. buying it we're believing it yes. in that moment so that just that proves the whole theory that like we're stupid and really clever at the same like our, our minds are like both simple and complicated in that we can believe something yeah. we know is manufactured i'm crying because i'm watching the notebook i'm excited isn't that crazy like, though it, because that's the human part of us that you're right a part of our brain makes the connection of oh, wait, there, you know, this is a movie set. This is filmed in a giant warehouse in England. You know, it's mm-hmm. not the countryside of like, I don't know, Italy. But a part, our heart, like our human side is like, he didn't call her back, yeah. you know, and then we start crying. But it's like, that's just the power of our minds. Our minds, whatever you tell it, it will believe it. Right, which is, and I've experienced that more recently with like, now you have the kind of phenomenon phenomenon of Netflix series and uh or and when you can kind of like binge watch f- five episodes or ten episodes in the three series so i now experience when i get to the end of that and i've finished all of them i'm like but what are they doing now mm-hmm. and where are the, where are the people now like you're just sad it's ended <laughs> it's you want like to keep you just, living oh, in that world right i can't tell you how many times i've gotten like stranger things um lost i've gotten just so many great TV shows that I've personally gotten very invested in. And then when it ends, I feel like a part of my soul literally yeah. <laughs> goes away. <laughs> it's like the equivalent of like holiday blues where it's just like, I don't know what to do now. Oh. now got, and then people go, and I suppose you go and find something else, right? Yeah. <laughs> so since you're on, you've kind of, um, your New Orleans experience, tell us a bit more about your sort of life and trajectory. What have you been doing since then? I know lots of things, but. Yeah. So Since then, that was when I was 16. So since then, I mean, after that, that trip changed my life. And then from that moment on, you know, my anxiety, it just got less and less. And I really noticed just like a huge overall shift where, you know, I went from like my freshman year of high school, I went from not being able to eat at school, which is such a specific thing. But I really had this fear of throwing up in front of other people. And it Mm. sounds so bizarre to say, but I'm not going to judge myself for saying it because 
it was just really, you know, the, like the deeper reasoning was I just, what I had a fear of losing control in front of other people. Yeah. That's actually very common. I've heard that a lot. So. Right. Yeah. I think a lot of people have a fear of like, it's just, it's different things, but it all stems back to like the fear of public speaking, the fear of, um, you know, just messing up the fear. It's like the fear of rejection, losing control. I have a fear of yeah. Right. It's all the same. It just kind of comes back to the same common fears. But so I had a fear of throwing up in front of other people. So I literally, you know, morning time school, I had like a cracker and then I would get home after from 8 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. And I would just like binge eat and I would like, stuff, you know, not stuff my face. I didn't have an eating disorder, but I would just eat normally. So for me to go from that where I was like starving throughout the day, I was so hungry, but my mind literally believed if I have a piece of food, I'm going to go sit in class and I'm going to throw up in front of other people and it's going to be horrible. You know, it's going to be, people are going to see the real Megan and they're going to not invite me places. But then of course it never happened. I never once threw up in front of other people and all these, it's like my mind was anticipating something that wouldn't even happen, but it was anticipating that it would. So then I, I was like preparing myself for how I would feel if it happened, yeah. which is such a bizarre thing. But so. Or not, like, but, but not bizarre. I mean, both like I always used to have this thing where I'd need to go to the toilet right before I went into a meeting. Cause I was like, well, what if I need to pee halfway through a meeting? What if I, <laughs> what if I pee myself? Now what am I going to do? Yeah. <laughs> right. And then you start like, and then you start working backwards. And so I, I went through the situation where I'd like, well, I wouldn't drink any water from like when I woke up and, and I'd be like all, all day at work and not drunk anything just so that I don't have to go to the toilet. Really? Yeah. So the Whoa. same, you know, similar theme that you're like, worried about embarrassment or you're worried about the what ifs and then you, the more you focus on it the, the kind of more restrictive you get in your behavior as well so yeah yeah it was just interesting but so that was sophomore year and then ju- my summer going into junior year or my sorry my summer going into senior year of high school I went on another rustic pathways trip and I went to Fiji and that was so much fun. That also changed my life. But after New Orleans, I was like, you know, I can prove it to myself. Like I can do cool things. So then I um, (laughs) went to Fiji, which is like the other side of the world. And Mm -hmm. that also opened my eyes so much. And just, I was living in a hut on an island and Fiji is made up of like 300 little islands. And I was living with this village and there was 20 other teenagers and we all were bonding because, you know, we're all so young, but we've never, none of us had ever been in a situation like this. So, you know, every night it was just like a bonfire on the beach and we're doing community service in the daytime and just this incredible, you know, seeing the stars at night and then like talking about life with each other. And I just feel like in those moments where you feel so uncomfortable, it's just, you grow. Like you, you just, it's like those moments where you feel like there's no other option other than to jump. I mean, not like in a negative way, but just take that leap of faith. You just learn so much about yourself. And in those moments, I just like my self-esteem went up so much because I was like, wait, I I like, I, I can do this, you know, all these things that I was talking myself out of and like, no, Megan, you can't do that because you're Megan Gallagher. So you can only do this, but it's like, no, no, we can, any, anyone can do anything, anytime. That's what I always say. So it's just really realize like, you know, our mind is powerful. It can, you know, convince us anything, but we can, you know, our bodies are a lot stronger than we think. And same with working out or pushing yourself mentally or physically. We can do a lot of things that I feel like we kind of talk ourselves, like we don't believe that we can do something. So since then, you know, I graduated high school, I moved down to LA, went to college for two years, didn't like it. I, you know, just was like, school's not for me. And I told my parents and they were like, amazing, we'll support you. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And then after, yeah, the two years I left college, just wanted to find my passions. And then I really realized, you know, I think I'm meant for motivational speaking. I've always loved being on stage. 
I love helping other people. I love just being a light and a positive role model for teenagers specifically because of everything I experienced. And it's just very special. I mean, I really feel like I have like a God given gift. I really do. And I'm not very religious, but I just feel like I have a very unique purpose in life. And, um, it just feels, it just feels right. Like I love listening to people. I love talking to people. I love expressing myself. I love just, yeah. I mean, just being like a positive light and an influence that people can think, Oh, you know, this girl, Megan Gallagher went through this and this is how I'm feeling. And I know I'm not the only one feeling this way. And I know I can get through it. And I feel like that feeling is just priceless. And really it just comes back to being the person that I needed when I was a teenager. Now I am that person that, you know, 16 year old Megan, 24 year old Megan. It's like, I am that person for her. Yeah. I yeah. like that. I mean, that was kind of why I got into podcasting in the first place because I couldn't find anything that was that wasn't very like boring and yeah. soft voices. And I was like, I don't want to talk like that. I want it to be like upbeat and positive, and we're going to get through this, and we're going to have a future, and it's going to be exciting, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was kind of like always my thought from the outset. But but yeah, I totally. And and I remember listening to Tim Ferriss back in the day, and he said something like he used the sort of term scratch your own itch. So like create something that you, uh, you at least yourself would be a fan of or want to Mm, listen to. I love that. Scratch your own itch. That's cool. So if you're doing it, if you have something that you think you would have wanted, then it's likely that other people would have wanted it as well or would want that type of support as well. And I think now like, you know, with the coronavirus thing happening now more than ever, people are going to need more help and certainty and positivity and, all that stuff moving forward, right? Like it's, uh, it's definitely made some people stop and reflect. Yes. And this whole, this whole quarantine social distancing, I mean, I think it's really, it's a very challenging time for a lot of people. And I, I really strongly feel just that the government didn't really take into consideration how, how much side of like how people would react and just the side effects of mental health of this whole thing, like how people would really be affected long-term from this social distancing and isolating themselves because yes, on one hand, I understand why it's happening. I fully get it. You know, I'm going with the program too. I'm wearing masks, I'm doing everything, but Mm. also you know, there are people who are going to have anticipatory anxiety after this, where they're anticipating what if this happens again? What if I have to, you know, because it's like this, this, it's just, I think it's triggering people's worst fears, this pandemic, this virus, this worst case scenario of, oh my gosh, what if, you know, what if the grocery stores run out of food and what if I go bankrupt and what if I lose everything? It's like, yeah, yes. But also, you know, it's just, it's really challenging. And I feel like the government really didn't think about, oh, people could, you know, start ending their lives. People could develop depression from this. And my heart just goes out to all the people in places like New York, New York City, where they're, you know, in these tiny little studio apartments and they are just like claustrophobic and they can't leave and they're just like getting cabin fever. Like mentally that is so, that's so not good for you. And I just feel, you know, what's happening. It's real and it's scary and it's upsetting, but it's also just the mental health side effects from this. And, you know, some people are going to have PTSD from it. It's just, it's really, really, really sad. Yeah. It's interesting time. And I think, you know, some people like my myself in my own situation i've found it to be massively beneficial because it's allowed me to sort of take a step back from my hectic life i have made some changes i have been mentally in a good place because i'm extremely fortunate that i've got my wife and my family i've got a gym in my house so i've kept up my routine and the things that keep me sane and healthy um and so it's allowed me to be like right i'm going to take some online courses i'm going to learn some more stuff and do things but I also know people who like relied on their um, work environment or their social network to actually like bring them out of themselves and be right? 
and be yeah. with other people if you live on your own and now you're not allowed to see anybody like that's that's very difficult if you're an extrovert and you get energy from like being around people so i think it's just uh you kind of there's no there's no right or wrong in any of this i think it's just being aware that people are going to interpret this thing differently just because you thought it was great and you had some time off somebody else has lost mm-hmm. their business and got divorced and and unfortunately some people have like you know taken their lives as a result of all this stuff going on right so yeah um and that's and that's why it's just you know that uncertainty piece has been strong also like all of the conspiracy theories and not just the u.s government but like all the governments around the world like who's doing what and are they trying to right you know are they scaring people on purpose are we looking over here to not look at something else it's just well you know the whole uh, yeah causes fear as well right yes and you know the whole thing because Basically, my therapist when I was in high school, I saw a few different therapists, but um, one of them, one thing that she told me, it just really stuck with me is where she, she just said, you know, Megan, a really helpful way to manage your thoughts is to just kind of put them into a category. Like imagine you have a file cabinet at home where, you know, you put papers like taxes, bills, and travel info, and, you know, all these papers, you organize them, right, by category and by date and what they're about. Imagine that your mind is like one giant file cabinet, and every single thought has its place, and it has its importance and service. But imagine, she just, it's just the way she said it was like, you know, think about your thoughts. Any, anything that starts with what if, or just be aware of what is like the first thought that's going to send you into a spiral. So it's important for people listening to realize this time, everything is out. Like so many things are just out of our individual control. And I think that's is what is triggering. It's, oh gosh, what if the government sent, you know, what if, and then what if China does? And then what if, and then what? If, okay, well then yeah. pause that 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 thought cycle where you're taking flight into like nowhereville of you know all those thoughts we don't know what's going to happen so she just said Megan you know be aware of when your thoughts are helpful for you personally versus are they kind of like no man's land where it's like but what if? well then but what if i mean you know i can't control that i don't know so she always just told me, Megan, just notice your, your thoughts. What do they start with? What do they end with? And notice if you feel like you're about to go into one of those spirals where it's so easy to do that right now, right? But mm-hmm. just know that it's not helpful, it's not productive, and it's not going to make you feel good. Yeah. And I think in, in days where I have had, you know, uncertainty or fear around the future and stuff, I just think like very short term, like, what am I doing today? Like, what does my day look like? And that, and that, that yeah. thought, by the way, is so much more productive. That mm. thought of just, okay, you know what? Instead of making it global, <laughs> let's take it local. What can I, you know, this tiny, what can I control right now? What yeah. positive choice can I make today? Because when you focus on what can I do today, what has to be done today in order for me to feel good rather than the whole month, I mean, just, and also, you know, separate yourself from the fact, you know, take away the fact that it's a global pandemic. It's not like anything else in life because life is all about choices, right? So what makes you feel better thinking about, okay, you know, what I'm going to have for lunch or in two months, what am I going to say to my aunt, you know, Joanne at Christmas time, who always causes a fight? What, you know, what's going to make you feel better thinking about this thing that's looming in the future that's kind of what if no that's not who who would like that that doesn't feel good versus yeah. oh for lunch what makes me feel good a salad that always you know makes me feel light and energetic and like i made a healthy choice for myself versus yo like what because okay well then you can what if for 10 hours and you can waste your whole day kind of imagining every possible worst case scenario yeah but it's like, who, who, who does that help? You know, that doesn't, that doesn't really make, you're probably going to end up like crying, having a headache and feeling more stressed and exhausted. So I just feel like what she told me in high school, 
I, I put that scenario towards every single thing. I don't view anything as different. It's a global pandemic. Great. I'm still going to use that same tool that she taught me that helps me navigate it for like what makes me feel my best and how I am going to navigate this situation. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. And, uh, I do think that like, I mean, I've said for a long time, I don't recommend people listen to the news. And if you hadn't no. if you just stopped watching the news for the last three months, you probably would have done yourself a favor and saved a lot of hassle. The news is the news is the news. It's media. They yeah. want to grab your attention. So of course they're going to start it with, and also, you know, if you think of the news as YouTube videos where, you know, the title is very clickbaity, you know, it's very like, the whole YouTube video, they're going to take the most like headline worthy to get your attention because yeah. are you going to click on a video that says, you know, how to like, I don't know how to like plant flowers or are you going to click on a video that says, um, you know, like Kim Kardashian plants flower. You're going to click on Kim Kardashian plants flowers, right? Yeah. Because it's more interesting. So that's what the news does though, is they pick the most like clickbaity, grab your attention headline caption. And they're like, you know, 10,000 people have died today. And you know, the president's not doing anything. They're, they're doing the most thing just to suck you in, to get your attention, to watch the, you know, 30 minute long conversation where for 30 seconds, they mention that headline. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've noticed that a lot. I mean, I've probably got more distrust in the media now more than ever, to be honest, after this thing. But yeah. um, I have noticed like the, if you, when you're looking at the news, just remember you're looking through a filter of like what's going to get your attention the most. When you, even, to, yes. even, to the, even, yeah. even to the extent where they're like, you know, this person died today. Instantly you're like, well, did they die of coronavirus or not? And then you have to read the article. If, oh no, they were 95. They just died of a heart attack. All but right. see, then the news has already got you because you already like engaged. So yeah. what you said, that's very helpful. Keeping it in mind when, when you turn on the news, just keep that thought of this is just clickbaity. This is how the media entertainment world works. This is just to get my attention. When you keep that, you're going to be fine. Yeah. Yeah, you have to know that you're looking through a filter for sure. Yeah. <laughs> so what so what are you doing now? Give us the give us your latest and greatest um update coming out of the yes. coronavirus time. What are you, what projects you're working on? Yeah. So currently um this during this time, I'm working on my fourth book. I'm really, really, really excited. Um I am working with a ghostwriter and really you know, my first three books were all self-published on Amazon and that was amazing, but this one I'm just, you know, financially in a better situation. So thankfully I feel very grateful that I can, you know, have like a publisher and an editor and all these really fun things. So I'm very excited and very grateful. And also I did my second Ted talk in February and because of the times, um, unfortunately the editing team wasn't able to get into the building again to, you know, edit the video. So that is put on pause for a little bit. And then that's going to come out soon in the summertime on YouTube. Um, and I started my podcast reaching new heights. That is, I'm on episode nine, but reaching new heights, it's really, self-explanatory. You know, it's all about what I feel every time you level up in life and you, you know, overcome that challenge, you, you know, just make yourself proud. You do something that you didn't think you could do. It's like you're mm. reaching new heights and, you know, you're ultimately reaching your best, highest potential possible. Um, and then I have so many things. I have just all this, during this whole quarantine, I've been doing Instagram live interviews with celebrities, influencers, artists, singers, songwriters, just, you know, people like CeeLo Green and Mariel Hemingway and mm. Adam Glassman and all these people who work at magazines and everything just, just to hear their opinion, you know, to learn what they're doing. And I think it's really powerful when people realize, you know, people like CeeLo Green and all these celebrities, I think it's very refreshing when people can hear that and be reminded that they're just a human being too. You know, they, they have... A challenge, challenging days, just as all of us do. And just for his fans to hear, you know, like, what is he specifically doing during this time to stay yeah. mentally well and healthy and everything. So that's been very, very fun. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, I just have so many fun things going on right now, but I, 
just, you know, I'm in a very great place in my life, (laughs) but mine is quarantine, but also, you know, I'm such a naturally positive person. Like I swear anything that happens, my mind literally like assesses it and finds the silver lining. Like it's just how I like operate. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, totally. I saw you. Um, I think I saw you on uh, Instagram live talking to Farah. Is that her name? Yeah, Farah. Um, Brittany. Um, her last name I don't know it off the top of my head, but Farah. Yes, she is the daughter of Kyle Richards, who is a housewife on Real Housewives of Beverly right. Hills. Yeah. Yeah, because um, yeah, she's from the real estate world anyway, so I kind of know. I know. Yeah. That. I know, know oh my all gosh. Her through that, yeah. Yeah. Do you know her dad or her? stepfather Mauricio I do know Mauricio yeah like I don't know him personally but I know he is I know the company the agency and yeah oh my gosh what a yeah. small world <laughs> yeah. yeah so I, I work for uh, a technology company in real estate and they're one of our customers so yeah. no way yeah oh that's awesome um yeah. but yeah you know Farah was I mean I've been such a fan of hers for so long and mm. she was so incredible like she was so open and honest about her journey with anxiety and she you know just it's just really it's very just refreshing and that's I use that word so much but it is when people come together and just you know talk like real life stuff and just I, I had no idea that she suffers from chronic anxiety and she said that her mother does as well and her a lot of members of her family have, you know, chronic every day on a daily basis, anxiety that they work through. Yeah. Yeah. You don't expect it a lot of the time, but that's, I always say like, that's one of the gifts I've got from interviewing so many people and speaking to so many people and doing some coaching and just now more so just having connections with people through social media because, um, so many people suffer and that sounds, Mm -hmm. you know, and that sounds bad, but it's also brilliant because it means if you're on your own thinking like, Oh, nobody can possibly feel as bad as me. Well, guess what? Loads of people do. Most people, you know, it used to be like one in three people yes. have anxiety. It's probably now like three in three people have anxiety after this thing that's been going on. But yeah, everybody, I think a lot more people can now understand and, and empathize with how it feels. And one really quick thing. I think it's very powerful, you know, for young people to hear that just, you know, there's people like an example, Kevin Love. He's a professional basketball player. He's clearly very successful, like well-known public figure, makes a lot of money. He talks really openly about his journey with anxiety. And it's just so awesome when people, you know, like at his level, I mean, he's really famous, well-known. He's incredibly talented when people who are like professional athletes, these very like famous singer song, when they talk openly of, yeah, you know, sometimes I have sleepless nights. Sometimes I, Mm. um, you know, have to take medication. Like it's just so awesome because it allows teenagers to realize, wait, you know, my mental illness doesn't have to dictate how successful I am. Like that is a game changer. When you really realize, wait, my anxiety it, it's not because I think people freak out too, like, oh, if I have anxiety or body image issues or something, then that means I can't do X, Y, Z. But it's like, you can literally do whatever you want. Whatever yeah. you believe you can do, you can do it. Yeah. And actually watching that, um, The Last Dance, the Michael Jordan episode on Netflix, like yeah. one of the things that somebody talks about in one of those episodes is basically saying like, everybody thinks like it's amazing to be Michael Jordan, but he never stops. Like if you watch him, he like goes into the arena, he speaks to fans, he signs things, he speaks to reporters, then he does the warm up and gets his whole team motivated and going, then he plays the game, wins the game after the media throng, then people want to meet him in the room afterwards. And so it's like, yeah, that doesn't actually look fun at all. If you could, <laughs> because he's just he's just always on. He can never stop, right? So that's kind of a bit of an eye opener. But my I was gonna say my favorite celebrity through the uh coronavirus has been Dwayne Johnson the rock because yeah. he's just such a bloody nice guy he's just he you know comes on and does his terramana tequila tasting sessions and does his cheat days on Instagram <laughs> lives but he's just like he just seems like the nicest most down to earth yeah. mountain of a man ever like he's just so considerate of other people he's just such a nice guy right yes um, i've i've heard very good things about him i've heard that he's very 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 like kind and genuine yeah, seems to be that way. 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time. Um, where's a good people for a good place for people to look you up on the socials or your website? or anything So like? I am everywhere. I, <laughs> I am everywhere and anywhere. <laughs> um, so I have Facebook. I have a personal page and I also have a business page. It's just Megan Gallagher. And if that doesn't come up, you can search, you know, Megan Gallagher, Ted talk speaker, motivation, right. anxiety, mental health. Um, I have Twitter. It is Megan W Gallagher. That is also my handle for Instagram. Megan W Gallagher. Um, I what does the and W I, stand for? It's my middle name Wallace. All right, cool. <laughs> it was my grandfather's name, so I was named. My middle name is after him. Right. Um, and so, and it's also helpful because on social media, I have the same profile picture for all of my accounts, so it's very recognizable. Right. I also have LinkedIn, Megan Gallagher. I have YouTube, Megan Gallagher. I do vlogs and anxiety wellness videos. And um, my podcast episodes are video and audio on there. Um, I have my website. It is MeganWGallagher.com. That's with all my books, blogs, contact info. If you want me to speak at your school panel, whatever, it is all there. Um, and then my email is motivational talks with Megan at gmail.com. <laughs> there you go. I think amongst all those things, people will be able to find you. I know <laughs> people are like, can you spell Gallagher? I'm like, give me a second. One's that. <laughs> yeah. It's the it's spell the same way as the Oasis boys, right? Yes. And yeah. okay. I know the Oasis, like, um, you're a super, uh, supernova, champagne supernova, but also the show Shameless. Their yeah. last name is Gallagher too. It is spelled the same Gallagher. way. That's one of my favorite TV shows as well. Amazing. Yes. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you so much for coming on and uh, look forward to keeping in touch and look forward to sharing this with, uh, with all the listeners. Thank you so much, Tim. Thank you. I am so, so, so grateful. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Take care. You too. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Anxiety Podcast. For more information, go to theanxietypodcast.com.